simple. But um, yeah, okay. So, but most people don't think about infrared UV as telescopes, like for astronomy. So, um, so basically, we're closer to the optical wavelengths of what, what you see with your eyes. Um, so, it's infrared. And so, as I said, your infrared is what you use for your remote control. Um, and also, infrared is so what you feel as heat. Um, from like a radiator or from a fire or something like this, that is in fact um, infrared radiation. That's light that does this. Um, as I said, ultraviolet uh, is what gives you skin cancer. And well, in fact, yeah, the infrared is kind of probably seen everywhere. So now these days, if you go to the uh, shopping center and they'll check your temperature and like, what's the point of this? <laughs> um, that's that's infrared, so it's all just just a form of light, and this is really really important to to sort of remember this. Um, and the ozone layer uh, famously blocks UV radiation, and UV radiation is bad for uh, your skin and ultimately for life in general. So don't get too much of it. But it is basically just light, as are X-rays and other and gamma rays, radio and optical light. So, as I've said in the previous lectures, your skin is kind of like eyes, in a way. It's like um, your skin is infrared sensor, um, and, and that's heat. And we'll talk a bit about that. So, we'll start from the first half of the lecture on infrared astronomy. So, so infrared, despite what you might think, is actually the lower energy of the two. So, uh, red is lower energy and uh, violet and blue, these colors are higher energy, actually. So infrared is, is very, very safe. It's um, actually it's higher energy than 5G. <laughs> um, and it's basically just heat. So what we experience as heat is, um, is infrared. And originally, it was called sort of like an invisible light. Um, and this is how William Herschel, so Herschel's a very famous guy. Uh, we'll talk into a bit of detail about, about him. Um, and so sort of it's a very fascinating story how he actually came to discover, quote unquote, infrared light. Um, so, in fact, the next few slides are based off a really, really nice article that I found um, in the American Scientist uh, by a guy called Jack White. Um, I guess it's not the brother of Jack Black. And, um, and anyway, so it's a really interesting article. I, the, I base my, uh, these slides off, off that in a, in a large way. Um, so let's sort of continue about it. So, okay, William Herschel. So he, uh, he was German, actually. Um, so back in the 1600s or so, so this is pretty unusual to have German immigrants going to the UK. Um, unlike today, where it's very common. So he was an amateur, he was a musician, but he became an amateur astronomer and he built telescopes himself. So if you remember last week, um, we're talking about in the 1600s, the, in the Netherlands, the first telescopes were starting to get produced. And amongst the, the rich people in Europe at the time, this became very, very popular, and Herschel was no exception to this. In fact, he, he ended up becoming the personal astronomer to the, to the king, and therefore became Sir William Herschel. Um, but, so William Herschel did a lot of interesting things, but infrared was probably uh, one of the more important, and one of the interesting things about it is that he discovered it while trying to safely observe the sun of all things. And if you know what infrared is now, that's not surprising, but at the time this was not obvious. Okay, so once again, we talk about the spectrum, the electromagnetic spectrum. So, so light is here in the, uh, the bit that says light, obviously enough. And then the infrared is with the uh, longer wavelength, lower energy, more red. So infrared literally means beyond red in Latin. Um, 
And as, as I said, we feel infrared light as heat, and it's not immediately obvious that they are the same thing. Um, so most things actually emit in the infrared, but, uh, but, but not all infrared sources emit in the visible light as well. So that's why, for example, if you, yeah, it says here, if you turn off a heater, you can feel it in the dark room, you have all the lights switched off, you can feel the heat from a heater, but you won't see the heater itself. So infrared can be emitted, but doesn't necessarily mean that you'll, you'll experience this in, with your eyes at the same time. But sometimes it will, like sometimes you'll see something red hot, and that's also emitting infrared, which is what you feel as heat. And as I said, this is all light in one way or another. So, so basically, Herschel had been observing the sun for, for, for many, many years, and, um, but he unsurprisingly worked out that observing the sun with a telescope is bad for your eyes. Um, this is probably not surprising to anyone. Um, so what he was doing, he was experimenting with different colors of glass. So this is basically a, a filter. So it's very similar to what, a, what sunglasses do, right? So they have a darker glass in effect, and that blocks some of the sunlight so that you can see in, you know, at bright things more easily. So he, that was a very, very early form of sunglasses, basically, um, in sort of sciencey way to say that's a filter. We are filtering certain colors out of the, the white light that comes from the sun. And uh, I think it's actually quite nice to just quote Herschel himself. So he said that what appeared remarkable was that when I used some of them, I felt a sensation of heat. Though I had but a little light, while others gave me much light with scarce any sensation of heat. So I like the, the very, very old style English. Um, but basically what he's saying here is that uh, depending on what color of glass he was using to, uh, to observe the sun, he would get more or less heat. So sometimes he would get lots, he would feel lots of heat, but there would be very little light. And sometimes he would get lots of light from the sun, but not feel much heat. Um, and obviously from this, he thought, okay, well, well maybe different colors might heat things up differently, right? It turns out he's on the right track. So he decided to set up an experiment to, to test this. So he suspected that if, you know, um, that if the heating changed as a function of color, there might be a sort of a best color to, for illuminating something. So it's like, okay, so maybe um, green is better for uh, illuminating something rather than red or et cetera, et cetera. And uh, maybe there was a best, a best color for seeing with his eyes. And therefore, a better, a best, uh, a best colorful warmth from the sun. And it turns out um, he's on the right track. He, he made some pretty big mistakes, and we'll talk about that. But the, the general idea of what he was investigating was more or less correct. Um, so, nevertheless, he, he wanted to test his hypothesis. So he built a uh, spectro radiometer. <laughs> Um, which is a really complicated word, but basically what he did, he just, this is a fancy way of saying he set up a prism and then he set up some, some cardboard and he allowed, and he had a slit, as you can see here, um, it only let uh, a single color through the slit and then he just measured the temperature um, of that color. So you can see he had his, um, had the sun coming, from, well, the light coming from the sun, ran it through a prism and then he just literally measured the, the temperature that was measured using just a, a thermometer. Um, and the cool word for do, doing this is called a spectroradiometer. <laughs> if you want to show off to people with complicated words, you can use that. Um, so, yeah, so that's what he was basically doing. In fact, on the right here, you have um, sort of updated version of his original diagram showing what he was doing. So he was methylot with uh, methodically taking uh, temperatures from the various colors. And for each color, he let the thermometer settle for about 10 minutes, and then he would make a reading. So what he found was that red 
um, was about 8.4 degrees Fahrenheit above room temperature. Green was about 7.5 degrees Fahrenheit above room temperature. And violet, which of course is the highest energy, was only two degrees above room temperature. So you yeah, had in fact discovered this. So it turned out that the amount of heating does in fact depend on the color that's, um, that was coming through from the sun. So if you filtered out the colors, um, you get different amount of heating. And this is actually kind of a cool or warm and important. But then uh, remember he was talking a little bit about illumination, so, so how well you can see things. So he had demonstrated that uh, the heating itself changes as a function of color. Um, but he was wondering, once again, like, is there a color that is best for, for seeing things, i.e. illumination? And to test this, he looked at uh, very small objects through a microscope um, and used various colors. So basically, it was very subjective. He just sort of looked at it himself and decided which color was best for illuminating because he could see lots of small things, basically. Um, so it turned out that, according to him, um, yellow and green was the best color for seeing small objects under a microscope. And the thing is, this is not a coincidence. And this is where he made some pretty big mistakes in trying to interpret what, what he was seeing. And um, can anyone sort of guess what the problem could be? By anyone on, on the internet as well? So I'll give you a hint. So he's using his eyes to make a measurement about illumination, right? <laughs> so his eyes are most sensitive to the things that it can see. <laughs> so it's not a reliable instrument. Um, okay, but we'll come back to that point. So, uh, so Herschel had actually expected that there would be um, that the maximum illumination would be this, the same as the maximum heating. And it turns out uh, this was not the case. So in fact, he found that the, the heating increased as it went past the red spectrum. So you get more and more red, you got more and more heating. Um, so in fact, he thought that the peak heating, quote unquote, um, would occur beyond red. And therefore, it couldn't be visible light. It had to be something else. And in fact, the beyond red here is literally what infrared stands for. Infrared is Latin for beyond red. So once again, it's kind of fun to quote him directly. I likewise conclude that the full red falls still short of the maximum of heat, which perhaps lies even a little beyond visible refra refraction. In this case, radiant heat will at least partly, if not chiefly, consist, if I may be permitted the expression, of invisible light. That is to say, of rays coming from the sun that have such a momentum as to be unfit for vision. Once again, the, the English here is <laughs> kind of complicated and annoying, but basically he's saying that you feel most warm even if there's no, no visible light. It's, in, it's beyond red, it's infrared. So, so what's causing it? So, if you remember from uh, a week ago, we had the chromatic aberration. So basically the, the way that uh, different colors of light gets dispersed through lenses and stuff, and causing this sort of blurriness if you observe the moon, for example, like in this case. Um, it's a similar idea. So, so, Hersch so um, Herschel noticed that this invisible light, quote unquote, was affected by the chromatic aberration that was known to affect telescopes back in those days. Um, so this gave him some hints that, that in fact, this invisible light may in fact just be a different form of light itself. Um, and he wanted to find out. So this is, this is a pretty big hint, right? So the, the fact that the heating was affected by lenses in the same way that uh, optical light or visible light is affected by a prism was uh, kind of important, and he a big hint that light was a bit more complicated than had been previously thought. So, how did he do it? Well, he, he just basically did the same thing as before. 
um, he just extended his, his previous experience. So what he did was he cut a slit in the cardboard where there wasn't any light. So he added an additional slit over here, basically, and then measured the temperature. And uh, indeed, he found that the, the temperatures were increasing as he uh, went beyond the edge of the spectrum, beyond the end of the, the prism optical spectrum. So it really seems that invisible light really was light. So, but this, of course, you can imagine, is a pretty controversial uh, finding. We know it to be true today, but back in the days, it was not so obvious. And uh, so, so what he was actually measuring was something like the heat spectrum. Um, in this context, the heat spectrum, what it's actually measuring is um, our, sense, our skin sensitivity to heat, basically. So, um, so this is actually the plot that he came up with. Uh, this is the real plot. So he had, so the idea of radiant heat was not popular with everyone's, but it turned out to be correct. But you can see here that he has the spectrum of heat. So he's me measuring uh, what color or not color, as the case may be, um, gives the highest temperature. Right, so this is what this graph is showing. So this the spectrum of heat, and then he also um, had the spectrum of illumination. So this is what he's looking through a microscope and seeing the most small things that he could see. And he was trying to see if these were connected. And actually, he looked at this graph and said, oh, no, they are not connected. They're different things. Um, because the, because the toad is so different, he concluded that uh, radiant heat and visible light were in fact different. So, so interestingly, he in initially thought the right thing, which was that the radiant heat and light were the same thing, but then he did this graph and he thought it was actually different. And this was the wrong conclusion to come to. And this is why it's such an interesting story, actually, um, because this is something that happens a lot. So what went wrong? Well, so if you look at the graph from the previous slides, you can see why Herschel thought this. But uh, the problem here was the response of his instruments. And in this case, his instrument was his eyes, right? So, so basically, um, what his actual instruments were measuring different things depending on the wavelength. So our eyes have evolved to detect the light from the sun. So obviously, <laughs> we... You know, we, we are most sensitive to the, the, uh, the light that sun emits because we've evolved to detect it in the first place. So using his eyes meant that he was sensitive to the brightest colors coming from the sun, not from the heat itself. And this is called a systematic bias. Um, so you can actually see here, um, over plotted, you can have the modern spectrum and you have the uh, the one that Herschel measured himself. And actually, the, the heat light spectrum was, uh, was pretty good, given the, given the technology of the time. But the, the illumination spectrum, the ability to see small things, basically was affected by the light, and that was a systematic bias. So um, it gave misleading results, basically. So it wasn't too bad, actually, but at least in this one. But... If you look here, so this is the illumination spectrum, and you can see um, it's basically your eyes. Your eyes are most sensitive to yellow light because we, we've evolved to be sensitive to yellow light. <laughs> so, so this is his instruments, which was his eyes, um, were only really sensitive to yellow light. And that is why this illumination spectrum is so, so different from the modern the modern uh, measurement that we make today. So basically, I mean, it's kind of obvious, right? So his eyes do not respond to heat, right? Your skin does, but your eyes don't. And then he was trying to measure uh, heat illumination using his eyes, which couldn't detect it in the first place. 
So it's, it's a circular logic, and this is and this is exactly the problem. And this is why he thought that they were really different things, but in fact they were the same thing. So and it's easy to criticize William Herschel for this, but I think it's really easy to see how he made this mistake. And I think ever even today. One of the biggest problems in all of science is trying to work out if you have systematic effects in your data, is there actually something wrong with your detectors or something like this you're missing, or, or is it actually a physical effect? We, it's actually really, really hard to work that out. And that's why I wanted to bring up this story because it's very, very interesting. And really one of the most important things to think about if you're uh, doing any kind of science, or especially if you see science reported on the news, um, it's good to think about your, the systematic biases in the things I do. And there's been really big uh, mistakes, even recently. Like if you may remember a few years ago, there was the uh, claims of faster than light travel in, in neutrinos and various other things, and turned out to be systematic problems. So. Is not, not just something that happens in the 1600s. So, yeah, so you can see here. So, in blue, you have the, the modern measurements, and in red, you have uh, William Herschel's measurements. And while the, the heat spectrum is actually not too bad, um, you can see his graphs look really, really different. But if you look at the modern measurements, they look almost identical, right? So, this is, this is the, the power in a negative way of systematic biases. So it turned out that Herschel's lack of understanding of the subtle effects of his instruments in the effects of his eyes led him to make the wrong conclusions. But nevertheless, ultimately, he proved that infrared radiation is indeed just a form of light. And even though he was ultimately wrong, I think, I think the story of how he managed to be wrong is arguably even more illuminating um, than the, uh, the discovery itself. Um, so I think I thought it's really interesting. If you want to go into more, more detail about these sorts of things, the article itself is really, really nice. I recommend it. So after all that deep dive, um, so infrared was sort of known to be a thing, but terms of astronomical uses, it, it uh, had to wait a, quite a long time. So there was a Scottish astronomer called Charles Piazzi Smythe. Um, he used a thermocouple, which is kind of like a thermometer, but more sensitive. And uh, he wanted to measure temperatures from the moon, actually. Um, so he went to Tenerife. I'm sure that is terrible. It's like, oh no, I have to go to Tenerife for science. Um, and what he found was that the temperature of the moon in uh, the temperature of the moon that he was measuring with his thermometer basically changed as a function of altitude. So, so what he actually discovered was that the atmosphere was absorbing the infrared light of the moon. So, actually, so what was happening? was the temperature of the moon would increase as he went up the mountain because there was less, less atmosphere absorbing the light. Um, so, and this is an important effect and actually uh, why we have to launch satellites into orbits or telescopes into orbits to do, uh, to do these sorts of observations, basically. Um, yeah, so that's the big problem for doing infrared astronomy, really. So Smythe showed that the, the Earth's atmosphere can significantly affect the measurements of not only light, but also specifically infrared light. Um, it turns out, you can see here, that uh, radio and optical are the least affected by the atmosphere, but nevertheless, they still are affected by the atmosphere. And the radio has some tricks up, obviously, to get around this, but that's another story for another time. Um, and you can see here, like, basically, you either have balloons, uh, but um, or you launch things into space, and this actually um, is the main reason why 
it wasn't until after World War II that we didn't get astronomy in sort of non-radio or non-optical uh, astronomy. So because we just couldn't see through the atmosphere. So in the in the infrared, um, for for example, it's a bit like having an infrared cloud all over the whole Earth, and this is a problem. Um, so infrared actually isn't the worst for this. So gamma rays and X rays are the worst, but still, um, it's pretty severely affected by by the atmosphere. And this is why we have the, in fact, the Herschel Infrared Telescope is probably the most famous orbiting telescope for this. Okay, so to, to talk a bit about the bolometer. So, so big advances were actually made in 18, back in the 1880s, more or less, um, when an American astronomer called uh, Samuel Piermont Langley invented the bolometer. So, so basically what's going on here, you don't need to know all the details, but it used uh, electrical resistance to measure the power of incoming light. So that meant that it was more sensitive to longer wavelengths. So getting around the, the problem of your eyes being lacking sensitivity at uh, infrared or radio wavelengths and these sorts of things. And um, in fact, these days, infrared is uh, sort of divided into, subdivided into three subbands called the near, middle, and far infrared. Um, you don't really need to know about this, but uh, at the far infrared, it gets blurry into uh, sort of millimeter wave radio astronomy, which is actually what I do. Um, so there's no real hard definition of what optical light is or infrared light is or radio light, et cetera. It's um, sort of by convention. So like the, the, the black hole image, for example, you could make an argument that it's actually infrared or maybe it's microwave, ah, it doesn't, doesn't really matter. It's just, a, it's just a name at the end of the day. So in the early 1900s, so it had lots of uh, thermocouples and bolometers. And so astronomers really started to measure the temperatures of the stars and the planets. And actually this turns out to be a really important thing. So, um, so the diameters of the planets were calculated in this way, I'll go to the details. They measure the, di the differences in the temperature between, between sunspots and, and the surface of the, of the, of the sun. Um, but it really wasn't a, a mainstream part of astronomy until after World War II. Um, so surprisingly enough, the infrared astronomy developed out of uh, Nazi research into night vision goggles. Because night vision goggles are in, in effect a, a kind, of, kind of like an infrared telescope. So there you go. Um, I'm going to have a little um, aside here about temperatures. We'll, we'll come back to this topic in the next few weeks. It's, it's actually really important. It gets into quantum physics and these sorts of fun topics. Um, but in the previous slides, I talk a bit about the, the heat slide, which means that um, every, tem every temperature, rather every object, um, has a temperature that is related to its color. So if you measure its color, you can measure its temperature, right? So, uh, so what exactly was the relationship between color, um, or more specifically the wavelength or frequency of light and, and the temperature, right? So, because you had this, the heat spectrum and you had the color spectrum and almost the same thing. So if you measure its temperature, you can measure, um, can measure its color or vice versa. And this was all happening about the same time that there were big advancements being made in quantum physics, um, especially by a guy called Max Planck, who you may have heard of. Um, in fact, that's the, uh, well, the Max Planck Institute is named after Max Planck, and I, I should know, I did my PhD there. Um, and this is where, so you remember last week we talked a bit about the emission and absorption spectra in, in light. So Kirchhoff discovered that light is both emitted and absorbed at exactly the same frequencies for any given element. So loads of elements were discovered in this kind of way. Um, but then there's something called a black body spectrum. So um, don't, be, don't be sort of put off by the expression here. So what they mean by black body is to say that if you're completely cold, 
will give off no light at all and it will appear completely black. Um, so this is what they mean by a, a black body spectrum. Um, and actually, so I think the way that it's put here, so the proof I am about to give of the law above stated rests on the supposition that bodies can be imagined which for infinitely small thickness completely absorbs all incident rays and neither reflects nor transmits any. I should call such bodies perfectly black or more briefly black bodies. So that's the black body spectrum is actually a really important concept and it's kind of it's kind of a simple idea, but it's also really difficult to get your head around this. Um, so basically, if there is a color and a color to temperature relationship, there should if you have zero color or zero light, you have zero uh, zero temperature. Um, it turns out that you can't actually have something with zero temperature, and this gets into um, to things the like quantum physics and these sorts of uh, these sorts of things. And but you can see how astronomy and quantum are really deeply connected. So a lot of people think they are separate things, but they really aren't. Um, so we're definitely going to come back to this story because it's really interesting and it gets into deeply philosophical territory very, very quickly. Um, but the black body problem was an unsolved mystery. So um, it was a problem because you couldn't have, so basically it implied that you could have something with zero temperature and zero light, but in, of course in practice you couldn't actually have that. And this was a really big problem back in the um, in the 19th century, the late 19th century, early 20th century. Uh, so Max Planck, along with Wilhelm Wien, found maths that could almost describe the black body spectrum, but well, why? So this is so they could mathematically work it out, but they couldn't understand why it was. Um, so somewhat famously, he uh, took a so Max Planck himself took a statistical approach by a guy called Boltzmann, so we'll come back to this. Um, but basically, he had to divide the energy up into small packets, i.e. quanta. And this is this is actually the origins of quantum theory, so literally where it comes from, to trying to understand the relationship between temperature and, and uh, color of light directly led to quantum theory and more or less like all the electronics that we have in the world today. So it's fair to say this is a pretty big deal. Um, but actually kind of fun was that Planck himself hated the idea. He, he hated quantum physics. He thought that it was completely wrong. But we will definitely come back to that. Um, so yeah, so as I said, just to reiterate the point here, so quantum theory was invented to explain the relationship between color and the light um, and heat and temperature and these sorts of things. Um, and because there was now an understanding of why there is a relationship between uh, the temperature and its brightness, uh, astronomers actually today, even me, use a concept called brightness temperature, which is basically a proxy for the amount of energy in a system. Um, and so for a long time, it was thought that there was a direct, direct relationship. So you could measure the color um, or the, the wavelength of a star or a planet or something like this, and this would tell you its temperature. But um, what actually happened was that in the, when they started making radio observations, they found that the brightness temperature of radio sources was way, way too high. So it had to be some other emission mechanism and it turned to us this synchrotron emission uh that came along and we'll talk about synchrotron emission later but basically it's the light that comes from uh having electrons whizzing around this electric uh, magnetic fields at near the speed of light but that's the story for another day anyway so to get back to the uh back to the the main topic here so infrared we'll get back into the quantum stuff later so um it was known that the atmosphere absorbed a lot of the infrared and so um, in the 1960s, astronomers started putting infrared telescopes on balloons and planes and these sorts of things. And uh, Sophia is actually a modern example of this. I talked about it there. Um, they found lots of interesting things. They, um, they found dusty cocoons around newly born stars. They found, uh, so one of the sort of in, in this, uh, infrared astronomy, one of, the, one of the most important things it does is that we can look at uh, stars before they start producing light, basically. So if 
uh, star formation, basically. So you, you meet in the infrared, but not so much in the optical. So we can learn how stars are formed. Um, you, can, so you have active galaxies and starburst galaxies. So uh, active galaxies, uh, that's what I study. So they're extremely bright galaxies uh, that have uh, black holes at the center and they're feeding and they're actually really bright. So despite being a black hole, they're actually one of the brightest things in the universe, um, otherwise known as quasars. Um, and just like um, other galaxies, at other wavelengths, active like galaxies are bright in the infrared. Um, but they also found that, uh, you know, quote unquote quiet galaxies could be very bright in the infrared as well. And the reason is that they were producing lots of stars. So they're called starburst galaxies. And uh, probably some of the more beautiful astronomical objects are the starbursts. Um, so ERAS was the first infrared satellite. This was a very good name, infrared astronomical satellite. Astronomers naming things well since 1960. Um, it was a joint mission between the UK, USA and the Netherlands, lasted for about 10 months. And this image over here was the first uh, whole sky image in the infrared. And you can see, if you've seen an image of uh, the sky in the optical, it looks kind of similar, but it looks quite different as well. Um, it led to the discovery of planetary forming disks, so where, uh, how planets are formed. Um, and it also led us to know how many stars are probably in the universe. So some pretty interesting stuff. SOFIA um, stands for the Stratospheric Observatory for Infrared Astronomy. So I have loads of friends who work on this. It's pretty cool. They uh, converted a 747 and stuck a telescope in the back of it. Um, it's still operating today. So they literally fly around taking, um, taking infrared images of, of things. Uh, it was actually in the news fairly recently because they managed to discover water on the moon using this. Um, and oh, yeah, I thought about this. So it seems pretty expensive to do this, but, uh, but it turns out that converting a 747 is still cheaper than launching a satellite into orbit. So they do these sorts of things. Um, but yeah, so what, one really cool thing that they did was, so Pluto passed between a distant star and the Earth. So, um, so you can imagine the star a long, long, long way away, and then Pluto passed in front of it, um, and they were able to measure the atmosphere of Pluto by doing this. So that, that was pretty, it was called occulting. And I, don't know, I, I thought that was a really cool thing that they did. Then we have the, uh, the Herschel Space Telescope, which was the largest dedicated infrared telescope ever launched into objects, still. Um, and it was launched by the Europeans and lasts for about four years or so, from 2009 to 2013. Um, made various discoveries, so we found that uh, the dark nebula were actually star-forming regions because they were being absorbed. Um, we discovered that the, the water on Earth could have come from comets. And we found a galaxy that produces about 2,000 stars per year, plus water vapor on asteroids. Lots of cool stuff. Um, so the Spitzer Space Telescope, unfortunately, just got switched off actually last year now. I should update this. Um, it was launched in 1994. It was uh, aimed at sort of studying cool warm objects like dust falling into galaxies and these sorts of things. It made the first uh, weather map of an exoplanet. It found the largest known ring around Saturn. It found the most distant exoplanet so far. Um, it actually directly detected light from exoplanets. And you can actually see here, this picture here, this is what Saturn looks like in the infrared, which I think is pretty cool. And you can see, so Saturn is here, but it has this infrared ring all the way out here. So you can't see that with your eyes, but in the infrared, you can see that. I don't know about you, but I think that's actually really cool. <laughs> I love seeing images of the other planets, of the planets in non-optical wavelengths. And uh, James Webb, which is the, the replacement for the Hubble Space Telescope, um, is, uh, should be getting launched this year, but they, they were saying that for the last 10 years, so we'll see. 
And I mentioned in a previous lecture that, um, that the, the James Webb telescope um, was going to be in the Lagrange point, so it's not going to be in orbit around the Earth. So instead of this slide here, so you can see the so Earth is here and it goes around the sun like that. And actually where the um, James Webb telescope is going to be at this L2 point. And it's going to be a long, long way from the Earth. It has some interesting problems regarding sending data back, but it'll be really cool once it actually gets launched. And it's very, very expensive, but anyway. Um, okay, I think that's uh, break time. Can we take a 10 minute break? I'll make it 12 minutes. So meet back at one. Be fine. Cool, is. Yeah. See you in a bit over 10 minutes.
And any any questions from anyone? All right. So now start again and talk about ultraviolet. Um, so if the infrared was the the heat part of the spectrum, so if you go beyond red, you get infrared, but if you go to the blue end of the spectrum, you get ultraviolet uh, or UV. Um, so this is the you know the eerie purple look that you go if you go doing um, laser tag or something like this. Um, so that's that's UV UV light ultraviolet. Uh, turns out actually lots of animals can see in UV, such as bees, but we cannot. Um, and in astronomy, it's actually probably the most recent, the most new of the um, of the astronomies of the, of the wavelengths. That we look, if you ignore gravitational waves and neutrinos and stuff like this, um, and the reason is that we needed rockets and spacecraft uh, in order to see through the atmosphere. So. We, um, Basically, the atmosphere is too effective, or the ozone layer is too effective at blocking UV light, and that's why we need to go above the clouds, uh, or above the, uh, above the atmosphere. Um, so, it was actually kind of difficult to find much, uh, much history of UV. Like, it's fairly unloved as far as things go, as far as wavelengths of light go. Um, but nevertheless, so the first guy to really Investigator was probably a guy called Angelo Sala, who was an Italian doctor and chemist, and he was playing around with a substance called uh, silver nitrate, um, which was at the time used as a laxative and disinfectant. So that's nice. Um, but he found that uh, sunlight turned silver nitrate black. Um, and this sort of gave him the idea that chemical reactions could protect people's health. Turns he was on the right track with that. Um, and um, because the silver nitrate uh, reacts from sunlight, so it turns black when sunlight hits it, it was used um, for early forms of photography. Um, you can sort of see the stuff here. So this is what silver nitrate looks like. And when it sees the sun, it turns black like this. Um, so hard luck Scheler. So Carl Wittenheim Scheler was uh, <laughs> called hard luck Scheler by Isaac Asimov. Um, because apparently he did lots of cool things and made loads of discoveries, but got uh, almost no credit for it. And this was no exception. He found that uh, paper soaked in silver chloride would darken when exposed to sunlight, just like our Italian friend before. Um, but he tried the same experiment, but with light through a, uh, through a prism. And what he found was that uh, the light at the blue end or the violet end of the spectrum was more effective at turning the uh, silver chlorides black than at the red end of the spectrum. So he had, had a lot of intuition here that there might be something interesting going on beyond the blue end of the spectrum. Uh, a good friend, Johan Richter, um, I talked about him at um, a few lectures ago in the electromagnetism that uh, he was the guy that gave uh, Rota the idea of putting a magnet near electricity running through a wire, like a current. Um, and he died young and poor, but as I said, I think he did a lot of interesting stuff. It was mostly forgotten. Um, he had actually heard about Herschel's work with infrared, uh, using prisms to see the invisible rays uh, beyond the, the red part of the spectrum, so infrared, right? Um, he thought that he could do the same, but at the blue end of the spectrum, so pretty obvious. And uh, he actually did this, and he actually detected uh, infrared light doing this. But uh, he died young and poor at only 33. So what could have been? Uh, I really want to find more information about this guy. Like, he seems uh, sort, of, sort of tragic, but yeah, I'm not sure. Anyway. Um, so when, while all, all this was going on, a guy called uh, William Wollaston and a guy called Farnhofer, who you may have heard of, were working on the spectrum of light in great detail. Um, they knew that the spectrum had these bands, you know, these absorption dark lines and emission lines we talked about a lot of times. 
Um, and they knew that this corresponded to different kinds of elements. Uh, so different uh, atoms and you know, molecules and things like this. Uh, so then Maxwell came along, so James Clark Maxwell came along and set up the theory of electromagnetism. Um, and that was building on the work of Michael Faraday, my, uh, a bit of a fanboy for Michael Faraday. And uh, this led to the researchers making their own UV light making machines, i.e. a UV lamp. So in the late 1800s, people could um, make UV lamps. That was, that was pretty cool. Um, we had these carbon arc lamps like this. So if you've ever seen a Tesla coil like this, making these zaps like this, the kind of purplish color, like lightning also is like this. That's because it's emitting in the uh, UV. So um, that's why it has the cool blue colors like this. Um, so they were not actually being built with the specific aims of making UV light, but just happened to emit in the UV as well as in the visible parts of the spectrum. Um, and so a carbon arc lamp is kind of like a controlled form of a Tesla coil. So if you want to play Tesla coil, it's kind of fun. Um, so actually, it turns out that these carbon arc lamps were the first kind of electric lamp, um, which is long before the classic light bulb. Um, this was the first way to make electric light. Um, but they weren't really practical. So there's a good reason we don't really use them today for producing light. Uh, but uh, they are used to make UV light today, um, but usually using different materials. Um, and one of the side things that, the, that they do with this is they use UV lights to artificially age things faster. So when they're testing materials and products and things, they put them under UV lights to see how they will uh, be in several years after, after use. Some practical applications. Um, in photobiology, so uh, one of the, I think everyone would be familiar with during COVID times, that using UV lights to kill microorganisms and these sorts of things. Um, so this was uh, something that was uh, discovered relatively recently and this has lots of practical use. And so this is UV light disinfecting and um, in fact, we use UV light to disinfect water these days. So. So in some sense, UV is very, very practical and very, very important because it allowed, allows us to have clean drinking water, uh, relatively easy. No. Well, no, there you go. Um, this is relatively cheap and easy to implement on large scales. And uh, this meant it had really, really big implications for public health. Um, and uh, this is over 100 years old. It hasn't really changed. It's still the same basic technology. UV light kills uh, microbes, basically. Okay, so what about in astronomy? So what about absorption and emission in UV? Well, so a guy called Schumann found that hydrogen emission um, is at about 120 nanometers. So when we say uh, nanometer, we're talking about the wavelength of the light itself. So a nanometer is very, very, very small. And so the uh, so is like 10 to the minus 9 of a meter, so it's a thousand times smaller than a millimeter. So it's, that's the wavelength of ultraviolet light. Um, and one of the interesting sort of discoveries around this time was that a guy called Minikan found that uh, hydrogen lines were at 20 nanometers as well. So this is actually pretty important because it implied that uh, there was more than one line per atom. So people thought there was just one line per atom, but actually the situation was far more complicated. And then uh, a guy called Lyman used a vacuum spectrograph to detect helium at 50 nanometers. And uh, this is where the famous Lyman alpha lines come from. So if you actually do astronomy, Lyman alpha is a tracer for hydrogen, basically. And it's really, really important. And in fact, even here in Sejong, um, some of the professors are experts in Lyman Alpha. Uh, not, not me personally, but uh, he won Lee, for example, does this sort of thing. So, as I mentioned before, it was established there's a relationship between the UV radiation and sunlight. Um, so, even back in 1902, a guy called Langley showed that the Earth's atmosphere was 
reducing UV light by about 40%, and which is good for or not getting skin cancer, but it's terrible for astronomy. And obviously, everyone should be astronomy instead, more, far more important. Um, so, Mito and Lehman investigated if oxygen was causing new UV absorption. It wasn't really, and then it actually turned out in the 1920s that it was found that it was ozone that was causing most of the UV absorption. Um, and unfortunately, the ozone layer is too high for, for balloons to go to, so we have to actually launch telescopes in space in order to do ultraviolet observations. Um, so you may have heard of UVA, B, and C in the context of uh, skin cancer and these sorts of things, but astronomers generally call them uh, the far middle and near ultraviolet, because we're boring like that. The origins actually come from biology, uh, but yeah, they get used by astronomers as well. But uh, UVC is almost completely blocked by the atmosphere, so we, uh, well, so UVA does make it to the ground. So you can do a little bit of UVA astronomy from the uh, from the ground, but if you want to do UVC, you have to really go get launched into into space, and certainly once you get into the X-rays as well. So you can't build an X-ray detector on the ground. Although interestingly, you can build a gamma ray detector on the ground, but that's a that's a story for another day. Okay, so. Getting into some UV astronomy, so it was known fairly early on that it would be difficult to um, do UV astronomy from the ground because of the absorption of UV light via the atmosphere. Um, but nevertheless, they tried to observe the sun using uh, UV telescopes on balloons back in the 1920s, uh, but this was unsuccessful. It didn't work. So it turned, as I said in the previous slides, it turned out that the ozone layer was still too high. Had to get above that. Um, eventually, there were some early experiments that were launched on rockets. And uh, in fact, these next few slides come from this, um, this talk I found on the internet, which is sort of a history of uh, UV astronomy. But you can see here on the right here, this is what um, a galaxy. So in the middle here is in optical. If you look through a normal quote unquote telescope, you can see on the left here, there's the ultraviolet. That's what it looks like. Optical again, near infrared, mid infrared, and then far infrared. So you can see how actually it looks quite different depending on which wavelength you observe at. And so, as I said, optical is really a tiny part of the entire spectrum. So, going back to uh, Lyman Alfred, guys, so he was a, uh, a professor of physics at Harvard. And he was, in fact, investigating the spectrum of the ultraviolets from the lab. Um, and he even climbed a 4,000 meter mountain to try and observe the UV spectrum of the sun, but was ultimately unsuccessful with this. Um, and he made the, the, uh, the first observations of the Lyman alpha lines. And as I was saying, this is really important for astronomy. And the reason, the reason for this is that if you can see here, on, so this graph here is probably looks really boring to you guys, but um, the bottom bottom panel is the spectrum of a uh, basically a galaxy that forms pretty soon after the Big Bang, and so you can see all these absorption lines, and that's telling you about the composition of the universe um, over you know, billions and billions of years. So by analyzing the spectrum like this, you can, can tell you can tell things about um, what the universe was doing just after it formed, and what sort of elements were there, and these sorts of things. So that's why a galaxy that's closer to us looks so different because it has less the light has traveled through less stuff along the way. And uh, so this is a re really one of the uh, the biggest applications in astronomy of of ultraviolet. Uh, telescopes. Uh, so I'm um, Spitzer Jr. So uh, he was primarily working on the physics of the interstellar medium. So the interstellar medium is uh, kind of like the atmosphere of the galaxy of the, of the Milky Way. Um, and he was the primary investigator of the Copernicus satellite that was launched in 1972. 
which was a 0 0.8 meter uh, UV telescope, and it was the first one to be launched into space. And you can see on the right here, that was the first uh, detections of uh, UV sources in the universe. And this was only in the 70s, so this is really quite recent. Um, and uh, so yeah, he actually turned up, he was one of the big people that pushed for the Hubble Space Telescope to be, to be launched in the first place. So, um, so I think it's sort of cool to think that this is really not ancient. <laughs> but the people who uh, launched the very first UV telescopes and UV satellites are still alive today. Um, it's, it's only in the last 50 years or so that uh, this decided to happen. So if, if you wanted, if you're interested in these sorts of things, I highly recommend getting involved. Um, but actually the, the first uh, spectrum in the UV was taken by launching them on rockets. So they found that the sun has uh, iron, silicon, and magnesium in it, which is a bit of a surprise. Um, and uh, they suggested that the magnesium in the spectrum could have been caused by an eruption of hydrogen on the sun just before the rocket launch. Uh, it's actually kind of fun, so you can actually look up these papers on the internet if you're interested in them. Surprisingly easy to read if you're a nerd like me and into these sorts of things. Um, so there's more rockets. So in 19, there's meant to be a picture here, but it's gone missing. Uh, so in 1979, another spectrograph was flown on a rocket. Uh, they found hydrogen. Oh, there it is. It's the internet being slow. Uh, they found uh, hydrogen, so H2 emissions. So I won't get into what that means. Diamond alpha carbon and oxygen. So they're finding more and more elements in the sun. Um, this actually turned out to have pretty important implications for, for how the Earth formed and how life, life exists and these sorts of things. Um, and in the end, they launched this instrument onto Skylab, which was a uh, space station that the, uh, that the Americans launched in the 70s and famously crashed near where I come from in Australia. Um, then they took the first UV spectrum of a star. So this is what the, the spectrum of a star looks like from a rocket. Um, it looks quite different from other spectra, but also not that different either. And, but the, the important thing I think for you guys to remember is that uh, by looking at this spectrum like this and over the biggest range of frequencies, it means that you can determine what the star is made of. It's a bit more complicated than that, but that's the basic idea. So by looking at this, you can work out what's made of, you can work out how big it is, you can work out how hot it is, and you can work out if it's rotating and doing lots of cool things like that. Um, so as you can see, it's really powerful, um, very, very powerful technique. Um, this here is the first successful balloon experiment. So as a, a lot of people tried to do this using balloons and failed. And <laughs> so they took a spectrum, but as you can see, it uh, kind of looks a bit like noise. It's not... Apparently they are measuring something, but it's not very good, to be honest. Um, this is pretty cool. So they actually took a far UV camera to the moon during the Apollo missions. And then they took a photo of the Earth in the UV. And this is what it looks like. So, um, so yeah, I think that's pretty cool. So they took a photo of the Earth on the moon or from the moon um, in the UV, and this is what it looks like. So Earth does not look very much like Earth in the ultraviolet. Um, they also did lots of other things, uh, took images of nebula, like star clusters, and even the large Magellanic Cloud, which um, is a pretty important satellite galaxy of the Milky Way. Um, the first European UV satellite was called Thor Delta 1A. It was used to produce star catalogs using UV observations and studied cosmic rays, uh, which are these mysterious high energy particles. And we'll talk a bit more about that. And also wanted to look at solar gamma rays and things like this. Um, the Soviets, of course, were involved in these sorts of things. So 
Um, the Orion 1 and Orion 2 telescopes were launched by the Soviet Union um, on the space station Salyut 1. And they actually took the spectra of Vega and Beta Centauri, which are the, uh, the closest stars to the Earth. So this is actually, actually pretty important. And actually, you may have heard that they detected some um, unexplained radio emission from, uh, from these stars just a few weeks ago. So that's a pretty cool thing. So um, some people think it could be aliens, but it's probably not. <laughs> it's never aliens. Uh, but nevertheless, you can see here on the, on the left, that's actually the, a photo of the instruments on the Salyut 1 uh, space station. Um, the Dutch also were, were really big in this. Um, so the Astronomical Netherlands satellite um, was a collaborative effort between the Netherlands and the US. And actually, you had an X-ray and UV telescope on board. Um, and it's a bit different because it had a orbit so instead of going around the equator, like most things, it actually went um, north-south over the poles in orbit around like this. And what that meant was that it was um, really good at taking pictures of things outside of the galaxy rather than inside of the galaxy because the, the Earth sort of spins around on the same axis, roughly speaking, as the galaxy itself. So by going the other way, you're getting more of a view outside of the galaxy. And that's what it was specialized for doing. Um, so that's what they did. They took the spectra of lots of extragalactic sources, so sources that are not inside our galaxy. So they could be relatively close by, but I say only a few million light years away to like actual billions and trillions of kilometers away. Um, and amongst other things, it discovered the existence of very hot stars within the galaxy. So even though it was trying to observe outside of the galaxy, Ironically, one of its biggest discoveries was inside the galaxy, and this was the existence of very, very hot stars, much hotter than most people thought could be uh, produced using the physics that we knew at the time. Um, so there was another UV satellite uh, called um, the International Ultraviolet Explorer, and this actually lasted a really long time. It's a real workhorse and lasted for, it was initially designed to last for for three years, but ended up lasting 18 years. Um, it did uh, the first large scale studies of, studies of solar winds, um, and it did a very accurate measurement of the way that interstellar light, or rather interstellar dust, absorbs into galactic light. So basically, you can uh, look at the dust inside the galaxy, and you can see how it absorbs light from uh, the beginning of the universe, basically. So that was something that they were doing using this telescope, and that's pretty cool. Um, so, so more results from this, that they showed that Venus had sulfur monoxide and sulfur dioxide in its atmosphere, and that, that this varied with time. Um, the spectrum of Halley's Comet was taken, um, or the UV spectrum was taken, and it was found that there was uh, 30 million tons of water was being lost from Halley's Comet during its passage through the solar system. Uh, we found many white dwarf companion stars, so uh, this is, we'll talk a bit more about what that means later, and uh, had many advances in uh, supernova physics, and this is actually a really interesting topic in and of itself. Um, with active galactic nuclei, or quasars, um, you can see, uh, so basically until the IEU, only one Quasar had ever been detected in the UV, and that was 3C273, which is a very famous quasar. But you can see here, so on the right here, um, is actually the, the jet of a black hole. So basically, a black hole is feeding and then uh, starts spewing material out near the speed of light. And this is what these pictures are of. And you can see that it looks really, really different depending on which wavelength. So at the top, I think, is actually UV, then it's optical, and then radio at the bottom. And the black hole actually is here on the bottom right. That's where we think the black hole is. But you can see, actually, the most ener energetic light is coming a long, long way from the black hole. So this is actually a pretty important discovery. 
Um, yeah, so you could measure the size of a black hole by doing this because of um, things orbiting around it. You can measure this. And we found that, uh, uh, that there was far fewer hydrogen clouds in the near universe than the far away universe. So it turns out that these, in the early universe, the clouds of hydrogen forms the early galaxies. This is how we think galaxies form. Um, Astron, which is another Soviet satellite, it was actually the largest uh, UV satellite of its times. It took uh, spectral observations of more than 100 stars, 30 galaxies, and several nebulas and comets. It also took observations of Halley's Comet and provided data that would go into models of how to uh, predict what uh, Halley's Comet will do. And it determined, amongst other things, that Halley's Comet should last for another 30,000 years. Um, and you over here, you can actually see these are the actual observations. This is what the spectrum of Comet Halley looks like um, from a Soviet spacecraft. Um, one, of the, one of the really important uses uh, of ultraviolet astronomy is observing the sun. As you can see, the sun looks pretty different in the UV compared to the optical. And uh, so what they really want to look at is these things called coronal mass ejections. And the reason they want to look at this is because if one of these coronal mass ejections goes off and hits the Earth, all of our electronics are fried. So this is actually a really important topic, and we'll go into a bit more detail about this. Um, and cool, and that's basically it. So there's a lot, lot to bring in on this particular lecture. Um, so remember, like, systematics. So... Um, what you're using to make the measurements can be biased if it's not constructed properly or like your eyes. So remember about how William Herschel made, made, the, he made the wrong conclusions because he trusted his eyes when he shouldn't have trusted his eyes, basically. And also, you know, look at the different wavelengths. The, the universe and everything looks very, very different depending on uh, which wavelength or uh, color of light if you prefer your observing it. And yeah, that's that. So thanks a lot. Any questions? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, we can't, <laughs> basically. Ah, uh, yeah, that's a good question, actually. So I, I guess that what's happening I'm not sure, but I think is that the UV gets absorbed by the material and then re-emitted at a different frequency that we can that we can see. So, so I, I guess that's what's happening. I don't know for sure, but yeah, like specific frequencies kind of get absorbed, cause some electrons to uh, jump up in the atom and then emit a specific frequency. So, I guess that's what's happening. Um, so. Yeah, so UV light will come in, cause electron to bump up, and emit, emit some light that our eyes can detect, I think. <laughs> I, I might look that up, actually, and confirm if, if, that's, the, that's, the, if that's the correct story. Any other questions from anyone on the uh, in WebEx? No worries. Cool. Ah, uh, yes, that's right. Proxima Centauri is the is the closest star to uh, to Earth, at least as far as we know. Um, but actually, it's a uh, have to remember. So, uh, so. There's Alpha Centauri, Beta Centauri, and Proxima Centauri. So I think it's a triple system from memory. Um, I, I think Proxima is actually the closest, and then Alpha, then Beta. I, but I'm not sure about that. I'd have to I'd have to look it up. I'm fairly sure Proxima Centauri is the closest star to Earth, but um, we're not sure about Alpha and Beta Centauri. Sorry, I can't give you a better answer there. 
Cool. Any other questions? Yeah, you're right about beta, beta, beta Centauri, so it's, yeah, <laughs> even I for a long time thought that Alpha Centauri was closest because it's called Alpha, but it's just because it's the brightest, not the, uh, uh, not the closest necessarily. Thank you. 